Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Our Life, the Black Youth Stories Project. The stories you are about to hear are based on the real experiences of young black Americans shared through our nationwide interview initiative. At this time, we would like to ask you to please silence all cell phones, cameras, and other noise-making devices. The taking of photos and video recording are strictly prohibited. Please unwrap any candy or cough drops at this time and take a moment to identify the exit nearest you. Please feel free to join us for our talk back immediately following the show. And thank you for being here and listening to these stories. Let's talk about the elephant in the room here. I know it's been bothering everybody, so it's only right that we address it before it creates too much more anxiety. It's not fair for you all to pretty much sit here and soak in the tension that has been created, so you know, we feel it and you feel it, so we may as well talk about it. So, here it is. I'm gonna say it. I can't dance. <laughs> I mean, I can't. I mean, never have been able to and never will. I mean, there it is, out for everyone to know. I can't dance. So your assumptions of me are incorrect. I overheard some folks talking the other day about seeing a black girl dancing at a club and wishing they were like her. Yeah, like her, because they didn't want to be her. They just wanted to know how to dance. See, no one can say that about me because they wouldn't be gaining any sacrosanct aptitude for dancing. They just have to deal with being black. Now, I'm not ashamed of not being able to dance. That was y'all. All right, y'all were the ones uncomfortable with it. <laughs> here's the thing. I put up with a lot of stereotypes that I don't perpetuate at all. For instance, I don't drink Kool-Aid. I mean, do you realize what that is, that powdered cold water? It's disgusting. I also don't eat chicken. In fact, I don't eat meat at all. So, sorry to ruin your notions of my nightly meals. Here's a good one. I have no illegitimate children. What? Yeah. <laughs> Therefore, there's not even a chance of me being delinquent on my child support payment. So, you know, don't even go there. Also, I am not unemployed. So lose the idea that we're all lazy people who suck the teeth of our government aid. I mean, ain't like they're interested in helping us anyway. Speaking of employment, I admit that I started at an entry-level position, but I climbed my way up. What I'm most proud of is that I did it without having to be less black and more white. Though, they tried. 
<laughs> of being encouraged to wear a tie to work. I mean, stop saying ain't and y'all. Giving skin and dap to my white bosses so they think they're included in my circle of non-Negro Negro friends. Hey. Nope. None of that. I got my promotions because of my work. Not my disguise. For that matter, I should add, uh, there are some assumptions about me that you would be correct in making. For example, I do play basketball, mostly because it was my way of staying out of trouble when I was young, and is now an easy and fun way to keep myself active. You know, active body, healthy mind. Healthy mind, happy life. Another one you'd be correct in making is that my father walked out on my family when I was young. You know, I did feel the stereotype of being the man of the household when I was only a kid. You're also right that I didn't have the same childhood that most white suburban kids have because I was busy taking care of my mother and little sisters. And you're also right that my family is more important to me than anything. And you're also right that I listen to rap music because it provides the only surefire avenue I have to being influenced by people that look like me, have been through what I've been through, and have navigated this hateful system in society the same way I have. And you're also right that I wreck my hood. But what you don't realize is that these aren't stereotypes. Family first. Never forget where you came from. Support your brothers and your sisters. Share your heritage. I mean, these aren't... Stereotypes like watermelon laziness and fried chicken. These are principles and gospel. They're pieces of the moral compass that we are so often accused of not following. But the truth is, we don't navigate blindly. The fact of the matter is that you arrive to a series of misguided interpretations of what blackness is. But who could blame you? when you're so focused on ignoring the elephant in the room. I love singing. <laughs> I've always loved singing. Acting, dancing, anything to do with those forms of art. Of course, this led me to my passion in musical theater. I want to do this. Like, when I get older, I want to have been in at least 30 musicals on Broadway. <laughs> I guess some of them could be off-Broadway. I won't get mad. <laughs> but my family doesn't exactly agree with this type of career field. I mean, my grandmother can sing. Her first daughter can sing. I think my old uncle can sing. My mom can sing. Mm. Well, I'll even sing with her. She's really good at matching pitch. However, they left any dreams of an artistic life behind and went for very safe, practical careers. They love it. If I was them, I would too. But I'm me, and me wants to sing on Broadway. <laughs> now, at first, my family was very against the idea of me going to a four-year university known for <coughs> computer science in order to pursue a bachelor's degree in musical theater. <laughs> and I never understood why. Being a family rooted in the church, maybe they were afraid that I would be lost in a world of sin and hatred. Being a family that believes in stability, maybe they were afraid I wouldn't have enough income. Both are very likely. <laughs> Or, maybe it's because we're black. Maybe it's because they believe that as a black man, I need to believe I can be whatever I want to be. Which means, I can be president, but I shouldn't be single. Which means, I can be an astronaut, but I shouldn't be a dancer. Which means, I can be an inventor, but I shouldn't be an actor. Because our history is rooted in the arts. The arts was our way of expressing hardship and pain and truth. But since I need to show everyone else that I can do anything, I can't do what I know I'll love. Because that's what any black man will do. Because as a black man, I need to do what white people can do. Because if I sing, and dance, and act, then I'm being oppressed. 
like my ancestors were oppressed? Maybe. Or maybe I just love singing. something under their breath. They were complaining, saying they didn't want to sit by the black girl. One of them even said that she didn't feel like I belonged in the class with her. Our teacher came up to them and asked them to repeat what they said, so they did. The girls looked at each other and told the teacher, we don't want to sit by that black girl. She doesn't belong. The teacher looked at them for a moment before shaking her head. She seemed to stiffen, and for a second I wondered if anybody was going to say anything. With a grimace, our teacher said, The correct term is African American. Do not call someone black. Then she turned around and went back to the board. I grew up preferring to be referred as African American after that. It was ingrained in my subconscious, it was my identity. My name didn't matter, age, height, weight. Nothing mattered but the fact that I am black. Society told me there was a politically correct way to address my identity, and that was the only way that I can be considered a person, because I'm different, and therefore have to be placed into a category. I'm not allowed to be just a person. I'm not allowed to be a student sitting in a classroom. I'm not allowed to be the kid those girls didn't want to sit by. I'm the black kid. I understand now what my teacher was trying to do. In her head, she thought she was helping me by placing me into a category that was created for me. But what I realize now is that Being colorblind doesn't mean anything. And categories? That's all of us are. Uh, white, Asian American, Mexican American, African American. Why do we have subcategories of American? Why can't we all just be American? I am not African American. I am an American. I am black. It wasn't until I got older that I realized the lack of identity I received that day in second grade. Then I truly understood what the inability to call myself black meant and how being colorblind doesn't mean anything. When you take away color, you're left with white, which is still a color. A privileged color, but a color. Isn't it better to stop categorizing human beings and individualizing them into subcategories of Americanism and just let them be people. Yeah, no, not me. 
me. That's never really been a thing here. I mean, I'm on the basketball team. I've never really hung out with many other black people. So that's saying something. I feel pretty accepted. Some white people don't even acknowledge me. I mean, it's 2015. 2015 and people still pretend like I don't exist. When our teacher was talking to us about you interviewing us for this project, he had to ask like a ton of people about who the black students at the school are, because unless we play for like a sports team, we're not worth recognizing. Until we get in trouble, of course. Yeah. I don't hang out with many other black people. <laughs> also, I don't date black girls. They're so loud all the time. I'm not loud. <laughs> if it was my choice, I wouldn't even consider myself black. My friends call me Oreo because I'm black on the outside, but I'm white on the inside. <laughs> Did I say something wrong? You don't see what they've done to you? What do you mean? Well, you didn't used to think that way, did you? Weren't you ever curious about your culture and heritage? Yeah, for a while, actually. But I learned it doesn't really matter. I mean, we don't talk about it in school, and no one ever wanted to teach me. So, figured it wasn't important. I know what I need to know. Harriet Tubman built a railroad for slaves, and Abraham Lincoln freed them. <laughs> man! What? Open your eyes, man! Don't you see that your friends have warped your head? What do they call you when they're talking amongst themselves and you join the conversation? What do they call you? Like I said earlier, Oreo. Or sometimes token. Token? <laughs> like, like token black guy? Yeah! Isn't that funny? <laughs> I mean, I guess it's a little weird. It only bothers me if I'm already in a bad mood. We're friends. We rip on each other. Do they tell black jokes? Yeah. Do you tell white jokes? They're white jokes? <laughs> no. I don't know any, but I mean, it only seems fair that if they get to tell black jokes, you would be able to chime in with some white jokes every now and then, right? Like making payments on time or eating mayonnaise and parsnips, that kind of stuff. <laughs> 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 Alright, well, that's enough of that. Um, what about you? Okay, I don't want to talk to anybody else. Um, what about you? You just said that that kind of stuff doesn't happen to you. Well, now that I think of it, it does. It's just that no one's ever asked me about it. I've never gotten to talk about it. I can't. I don't want to talk about this anymore. May I leave? Thank you. All right. What's your next question? By the fifth statement, each person that has, with no regret, shared a discriminating piece of their stereotypical joke book will call themselves my friend. They are. With every pat on the back, every warm hug, every fist bump, every peace sign, every high five, we call each other friends. They have my back and they will always be there for me. Whenever my teacher begins to timidly dive into a brief lecture about black history, they all involuntarily turn and look at me as if my skin color is a doctorate degree in African American studies. <laughs> They're my friends. Whenever we hang out on a weekend and I quickly mention that chicken sounds like 
really frickin' good right now. They all let that jackpot smile line with a thousand black jokes, conquer their face while their elbows nudge me, pleading for forgiveness because they know I can hear their brains chuckling about purple drink and watermelon. They're my friends. Whenever a black couple walks into the theater right before my performance, they eagerly play the game of find my parents, hmm. not knowing that the white man and his mixed son are my uncle and cousin, and they are the only ones who can make it to my show. They're my friends. They could have asked if my family was coming, but they didn't, so I can't blame them. They could have asked what I meant when I said I wanted chicken, but they didn't, so I can't get mad. They could have asked if I felt comfortable watching the night professor skim through my history like a stack of magazines, but they didn't. So I can't get annoyed. So when my friends come up with a really good black joke, no, it's okay. And when they find the nerve to ask if I'll get mad, you can say it. And when they look at me for reassurance after the punchline, I think I heard that one. And when they decide it's time to lay down a couple more, <laughs> I've definitely heard that one. When they finally run out of bullets to pierce my African-American dignity, that was pretty good. story do you want to hear tonight? Let's see, what do we have? Oh, how about Cinderella? White. How about Peter Pan? Also white. Snow White? <laughs> <laughs> Wait. Oh, how about Sleeping Beauty? Still white. What story am I supposed to tell? Yours? My story. What about my story? It's fit for fantasy. I'm just an average girl from a middle class neighborhood who married and had a child. What about my story? It's fit for a fairy tale. All of it. What's more valuable than sharing with your child that you were able to make for yourself the life that you wanted? without being held back by what others expected of you. I guess. I mean, I didn't do it on my own. I had close friends. And I had a teacher in college that really helped me, Mr. Leonard. He was my black studies teacher who really taught me about my history. He told me that I do have a valuable place in this world. I just needed to learn how to create it for myself. What did Mr. Leonard teach you? What story do you remember with him? When I was 18, a freshman in college, he told me how much of an accomplishment it was for him to be teaching a class on the topic of black studies and to have a black student. I was the only one. He basically told me I'd be his favorite if I took it seriously because most others didn't. Others either pretended like they knew the material, or pretended like it wasn't relevant to them. And that's why I eventually took up the major. I found that the more I learned about my heritage, my history, the more I discovered about myself. It's a pretty amazing feeling to learn about yourself from events of the past, especially when you're learning it from someone who will teach you what others won't. 
I remember being in high school just a year earlier, and we only spent 25 minutes in U.S. history class talking about slavery, the civil rights movement, and the Watts riots. I was the lucky one. Many of my friends' classes didn't talk about the civil rights movement at all because it's easier to peg us as objects of service and crime. So when Mr. Le Leonard taught me about Black Wall Street, during North Carolina and the church meetings during the civil rights movement that he attended as a young man, I knew I was about to learn something special from someone phenomenal. He fought so that he could someday have his own classroom, and he fought so that I could be in one of those seats. There was no way I was going to waste that. Well, here's your chance to inspire someone with your story, just like Mr. Leonard did for you for his. You're right. All right, baby. I'm going to tell you the story about how your mommy made a difference to one very passionate and smart man because I want you to know how important it is to inspire others and know your history. Where you come from is not insignificant. We can tell all the fantasy fairy tales of princesses and kingdoms, but you don't need that. You already descended from royalty. Turn the corner, and you turn your head. I zip my jacket, and you zip your bag. <clears throat> Both our breaths are equally cold. There's one of us equal, and there's one of us told. Told what to do and told what to be. Click. Beep. Boom. I see the looks, the whispers, the groans. And I know the nods, the wide eyes, the tones. Tones of voices suddenly stopping. The tone of silence, the tone of fear. I sense the tension the moment I'm near. Click. Beep. Boom. Door lock. Click. <laughs> Car alarm. Beep. The realization that I'm nothing but the stereotype and violence you fear. Boom. Makers for the other 99% of us who have some sort of problem with that or something, I think. So yeah, I mean, that was dope. I mean, did you see how the police totally came and provided security and shelters and porta potties and heaters and stuff? Oh, what a victory for those folks. I mean, those folks who protested in their tents during the day and then rented them out to the homeless community at night while they returned to their homes. I mean, so much good for only trivial compensation. 
Did you know that 66% of the occupied protesters were white? Mm -hmm. And some 80% had at least bachelor's degrees. Wow. What an eclectic group of people. <laughs> <laughs> the potential for degree diversity is off the charts. That's 99% representation right there. I personally feel very well illustrated, especially considering blacks make up about 13% of the U.S. population, an enormous 18% of which have bachelor's degrees and higher. That's how you peacefully protest. I mean, way to set an example, Occupy Movement. Not like those guys over in Baltimore. I mean, you know the ones who started out with the peaceful protest and then were later agitated and antagonized by the public, calling the silent demonstrators uh, niggers and thugs. Which totally don't mean the same thing, by the way. And then were later agitated and antagonized by the police who broke up the silent and peaceful protests, to which we have a constitutional right, I should add, by throwing tear gas, mustard gas, and combo grenades, even though there was no evidence of any hostility. Yeah, those guys went about it all the wrong way. What they should have done was occupy Baltimore. <laughs> they should have protested the overall governing decisions of the city and hoped that the whole Black Lives Matter thing would just kind of fall into place through that. Why fight for one cause when you can fight for so many others bunched into one and be really inclusive and neat? Why? Because protesting for a cause means believing in something. The people of Baltimore, Ferguson, Cleveland, Oakland, Portland, Los Angeles, New Orleans, Sanford, Charleston, New York City, DC, Detroit, Tulsa, Riverside, Seattle, and many other cities all had one cause for which to fight. Justice. Justice, Justice for Freddie Gray. Justice for Eric Garner. Justice for Trayvon Martin. Justice for Tamir Rice. Justice for Mike Brown. Justice for Yvette Smith. Justice for Victor White III. Justice for Azal Ford. Justice for Walter Scott. Justice, justice, justice. James Holmes sits comfortably in a cell with three meals a day after killing 12 people in an Aurora, Colorado movie theater. Meanwhile, 12-year-old Tamir Rice will never again return to the park he was playing in when he was shot by Officer Tim Lowman, who still holds a job he never proved to be qualified for under restricted service. So, before you pass judgment upon us, criminalize us, animalize us, take a moment to inventory what privileges you have. Meanwhile, we'll be over here. Counting off the innocent family members we've lost. Occupying Blackness. <laughs> diversity? Uh, let's talk about diversity. Diversity is defined as being a range of different things. <laughs> I mean, diversity in the workplace is supposed to represent people using their background and influence to inform their approach to a common issue, challenge, or goal. All right, institutional diversity is just about the number of diversity groups, percentages and numbers. Now, what do all these percentages and numbers actually achieve? Grants, private monetary support, and demographically specific programming. I mean, sounds great, right? But what does this actually translate to? Money and recognition. That's it. That's the end of the conversation. I mean, where does the money go if not to funding programs to support the unacknowledged populace of the percentage? I mean, what's the difference between bragging about the number of black, slave, black students you have for the sake of recognition or bragging about the number of black slaves you have for the sake of status? I mean, and if you're that proud of it, why not work harder to help us succeed? Why is it while there is a growing number of black students enrolling in higher education, no more than 40% complete their degrees within six years? I mean, where's the effort for retention? Where's the effort to create a sense of belonging? You know, this was not a gift. I was not given the opportunity to go to college or allowed to work this job. I earned it. I worked just as hard, if not harder, than the people that surround me on a daily basis. Mostly because I have to. 
and yet I'm acknowledged for achieving the same things they do, despite having put in twice, three times, six times the work. I used to be enrolled in a four-year university. But conditions of my home life changed and caused me to fall behind on school. Now, when I asked for help, not pity, but for assistance, I was brushed under the rug. I mean, the number of black students that drop out of universities isn't a coincidence. We don't drop out and then we're black. From the moment we grace this earth, we're black. I.e., we're dropouts, drug dealers, gang members, and lowlifes in the eyes of an overwhelming percentage of people that don't look like us from day one. So, when I was searching and, and begging for help, Nobody helped me, because in their mind, my fate was sealed. So I was predestined to work two or three dead-end jobs. And despite doing the right thing after falling behind by asking for help, that's exactly who I am. Not because I believed it, but because no one that could help me believed I deserved it better. Institutional diversity is not about the success of minority groups. It's just about the ownership of them. believe that this is their body, that my body is not my property, but theirs. They touch me as I walk into a room. They call out to me on the street. They take their indiscreet, quick glances at my chest. They rubberneck as I <coughs> ignore them and walk on by. This is my role. These are my fingers, my toes, my ears, my lips. An itemized list of strange fruit. This is my skin, the color of animalism, the color of sexual aggression, the color of expendability. So they take my womanhood as if it were their own. So they take my strength as if it were disobedience. So they take my innocence as if I never deserved it. So they take my self-defense and turn it into shame. They try to be the strong woman that I am and say, no, they just say it, didn't say it loud enough. It has nothing to do with the clothes that I wear. No matter my wardrobe, I always wear sex. I am the guilty pleasure that warrants no remorse. These were my hips, my legs, and eyes. This was my chest, my neck, and body. This was my womanhood. This is my skin. Evidence. You want evidence 
that racism still exists. You can't look around and see that it is a prevalent part of every second, of every minute, of every hour, of every day, of every week, of every month, of every year. Really? Guard. A recent study at the University of Chicago sent in resumes to thousands of employers nationwide. The information, job experience, education, you name it, was exactly the same, but the first name was changed. On half of the resumes, they used the name David. On the other half, they used the name Dante. Upon evaluation, the resumes for Dante were 50% less likely to be called back for an interview. Dove Cosmetics. You know, like soap and body wash and stuff. Marketed a tanning oil as being best used on normal to dark skin. Blacks are four times more likely to be pulled over by cops. All the recent events regarding the black body and police violence, in fact, in 2014, more blacks were killed than those that died during the 9-11 attacks. Also, more blacks are incarcerated in prisons than there were slaves in 1850. The fact that I was accused of stealing a painting from a department store last week after I had just purchased it and was walking out. The looks and glances I get walking down the street. The new racial slurs of, that's ghetto or he's a thug. In a recent video by 16-year-old actress Amanda Sandberg, she points out that popular recording artists are profiting off black stereotypes. Katy Perry eats watermelon in a music video and points to a picture of Aretha Franklin. Taylor Swift crawls under a line of girls twerking, with a black female leading the line. Because, after all, black bodies are the ones that are easily expendable and acted against, whether it be sexual or violent. In 2004, a board game was created called Ghettoopoly. Monopoly, but the railroads become liquor stores. The tax square alternates between pimping hoes and carjacking. You don't buy property, you steal it. The game pieces are things like a marijuana leaf, a pimp, a hoe, a 40 ounce, a machine gun, a crack rock, and a basketball. Racial profile, period. I am always, without a doubt, stopped in the line at the airport. If I'm walking into a store, I'm watched, sometimes followed, questioned. When I'm walking down the street, people expect me to step off the sidewalk, or they'll just turn the other way just to avoid me. Because, because of, of the color, color of my skin. skin. Do you need more? Because I have 20 some odd years. Of daily experiences to, to share, share with you. you. years old, my brother and I were outside at the park. My brother and I were twins, and we of course did all the same things. We had the same everything. Same shirt, same shoes, same hat, all that. This day though, we had different toys. I had this super cool Megazord action figure that split to all the Power Ranger vehicles. But my brother, he had a water gun. We were just playing with our toys outside when he started pulling it at people and making bang bang noises. <laughs> After a little while, there was a deafening <laughs> bang. Much louder than any sound my brother could make. And then I looked over. And 
saw his body. On the ground, shot by a police officer. Six years old. Killed because he had a water gun. Part of me died that day. And I looked at him. Not because he was my brother, but because I saw what I would look like if I were killed. It's one thing to say, that could have been me. And another to ask, is that me? It wasn't. It was my brother. Wish it were me instead. My mom was so distraught and heartbroken that she couldn't tell us apart, even though she always could somehow. She had to ask me who I was so she'd know which one of her children to mourn. I've never been the same since then. Never been the same since I watched my brother and I die at the same time. I see blackness as a way of life. But others see it as nothing but limitation. So every situation I'm ever placed in, no matter how offensive or racist, I see no hope for changes. This, this is the stasis. The one fact that remains is, no matter when or where the hate hits, I'm, I'm stuck. stuck. I'm, I'm fucked, fucked really. really. And I worry for my family because having a black child is insanity. If it's a boy, he's facing criminalization. If it's a girl, she's the face of sexualization. Bringing a child into a nation of discrimination. Where's, Where's the, the humanity? humanity? We're a civilization based on a foundation of racism, but we can't even face it. We're, We're complacent. complacent. I see blackness as unification. I see perseverance as an ideal met best by those, those meant, meant to, to protest. protest. To contest the events of recent past and strive to put it in in time for future lives. Because while I accept that there will not be progress in my lifetime, I know that my children deserve better than me. My forefathers are not the ones who founded this country. They're the ones who fought and died so that I could have an education. That fought for principles upon which they themselves would not be able to capitalize. My people fought for me. And so will I fight for the next generation. Because blackness will continue to be. Generalized, criminalized, and sexualized for many lifetimes to come. We must protect them from the system designed to limit us. We must navigate those limitations. We must demand to be heard by those who ignore us and care for our own and the people that care for us. Because, because blackness, blackness is us. Blackness is beautiful. Blackness, blackness is... Bruised. Criminalized. Sexualized, insulted, insulted stereotyped, tight, excluded, limitation, ingrained, ingrained used, unacknowledged, fatal. fatal. Blackness, Blackness is.
comments, but we just want to let everyone know that the uh, talkback and this performance were both recorded because thanks to our partners at Home Run TV, this will continue to live on as an archival copy so that other places and people, my mom's going to get to watch it. <laughs> but, you know, and, and beyond that, also other uh, educational programs and other theater companies will have the opportunity to see this. So we just want to make sure everyone is aware of that. Uh, my name is Ross Jackson. I am the uh, creator, producer, and one of the writers of the project. Uh, this is Megan Gainey, who, above all, is the, the woman of my dreams. But she is the uh, co creator and one of the co writers. And soon we'll be joined by a few of our cast members as well as our director. Oh, great. And by yes. soon, I mean now. Uh, this is one of our actors, uh, Maribel Martinez. Christopher Beard. And uh, another actor, Taylor Fagan. Who is also one of our co writers. And uh, our director will be joining us. Oh, great. By shortly, again, I mean now. <laughs> Yeah, this is Amanda Novella. She's our director as well as our director. And, uh, before we, we begin uh, with the uh, talk about everything, we also want to take a moment to acknowledge uh, Professor Joel Beanstra, who's here this evening, who is also one of our co producers on the project. Mm -hmm. And he is helping, uh, <laughs> helping with that, that recording footage. Uh, so, and uh, I like to do this. Uh, so I, I ask that you all also give yourselves a round of applause for being here and taking the time. So thank you all very much. Uh, so before we, oh, we oh, okay. say and our stage management. Oh, I don't do that now. Yeah. Well, yeah. We'll, do that now. <laughs> we'll do it now. Uh, our stage management team, who makes all this possible because they give us a safe place to create these things, uh, Alex Meyer, who's our stage manager. <laughs> Everybody. We also have a fantastic board op that does sound lights and projections. <laughs> we be working hard in here, y'all. <laughs> so thank y'all very much. Uh, before we dive into uh, taking questions and uh, any comments, and things, we just want to we like to give a little bit of the uh, history of how the project came to be and things like that. And so uh, I would like Amanda to tell all of you a little bit more about the process and in getting into. Uh, where the stories came from, and what happened before we hit the rehearsal room. So our story gathering process came through a variety of different things. Some of it was through email or Facebook and Ross reaching out, like like you said in the pre-show announcements, a nationwide initiative. But another part of that was also story circles that we did with local high schools and also here at UC Irvine, where we went in and Ross and I collaborated to come up with questions and activities that helped these individuals talk about these experiences, and uh, and that's what helped to develop the, the play throughout. And what we noticed at every single story circle is that everyone mentioned that they had never been asked these questions before. Mm. And they just were so thankful to have a place to be able to share these experiences, because otherwise no one would even ask. And so uh, a couple of the questions uh, that, that we asked at those story circles were, what when was the time that you ever felt excluded? Uh, we asked if they believed that racism was over, why or why not? And we asked if they had a role model in their lives and who that person might be. And we also asked if they, uh, or what they wanted to be when they grew up, and also if they felt like they actually could achieve what they wanted to be when they grew up. So a lot of those questions and a couple of other activities really helped us get ideas for this play it informed the entire rehearsal process with uh, the staging, with uh, the design, lots of different aspects where just remembering those people that spoke up at, at the story circles and shared their stories, it affected the entire process. And it was really exciting because some of those individuals have been able to come see the show, um, which is really neat to sort of hear them react to the things that they uh, contributed, which is really awesome. And something else that we did with within the rehearsal process was that the actors got a chance to also participate in the story circle. So they, they got asked those same questions and had to think about those things that the youth and also the individuals here at UC Irvine had to think about those really hard questions and, and uh, answer them together in rehearsal. So that's kind of like the backstory of how we got all of the ideas rolling and how uh, our writers were able to get inspired from that and then write 
uh, the pieces, some of the pieces for the show. Uh, so do any questions or comments come to mind? We can continue to also give you more background, but Adam, yeah. Yeah. I'm curious uh, if any of the, the story donors that you had, if they participated in the crafting or the formatting of the piece that you used, or the material that you actually used. <laughs> well, um, I, being, being one of the writers of the, the show, I wrote two of the pieces I did, and yes, hmm. I did end up formatting. Um, personally, I did. Um, so, then that was a big thing, mostly because we, like, and I, I'm just speaking for me, because I also perform pieces that I didn't write, and one of the parts of the process of rehearsing this was making sure, one, that the main, of, the main point of each piece was, what's the word, expressed, shared, for lack of a better word, and at the same time, that it did the way we said it was a way that was natural for us. So yes, some of the pieces were kind of tweaked into ways that we would normally say things. Even the ones I wrote, I was like, I wouldn't say that, I don't know why I wrote it. Um, and so I didn't change it. But also some of the pieces we didn't write, we realized that some, just some of the like syntax and the words that the way we, it was formatted wasn't the way we usually say it. But we still, the main point was to keep the objective of the piece and to keep the issue in the piece and not change that. So like main points of the pieces were not taken out and stuff like that. So, yeah. Uh, as far as uh, the stories that were inspired by um, the story circles locally and submissions that we received from um, people that reached out to us from different different states. You know, we had people from Florida, we had people from Arkansas, people from uh, Louisiana, we had people from New York, we had people from DC, we had people from Seattle, Oregon, Portland, Oregon, um, and a couple other places that I'm forgetting. Um, submitted stories um, and and what it uh, we took um, The, um, we, we wanted to stay under the guise of, of ambiguity, so if there was something in a story that was very, very personal to the person that, that wrote the story, um, we wanted to make sure that they, that they knew and felt comfortable with, with giving us that story, knowing that their, uh, their name wouldn't be attached mm -hmm. to what was, what was being uh, presented and so the stories were formatted in a, in a way and, and, and they were aware that the stories would be formatted in a way where their their personal uh, any anything personal that they had that they had said would, would remain between us and them it wouldn't be shared with with um, within the production um, and then uh, we also took uh, the specific uh, ideas or specific things that were said in different interviews and things like that um, and kept those like word for word transcripts and put those into stories as well so some of them are, are co like compilations of different stories or compilations of interviews or things because we also did interviews with, with some people as well um, just to get you know talking about about these issues and um, uh, and then also um, a couple of the pieces are, are, are poems uh, that were inspired through conversations and inspired through stories that we read and, and things like that. Um, yeah. Is there one? Uh, what, what was it like for those of you that uh, wrote pieces and got to perform or, or anybody else in the creative process to show your own work like that, to share a story? I'm just curious what that was like for you. It was interesting. Um, it was kind of difficult, not going to lie. Because I think one of the main things for not only me, but the people for us and for the people who actually participated in the story circles and interviews is that, and for this production, is that we don't get the chance to say these things. Ever. And 
this, for me personally, I was at first kind of hesitant when I thought about it to be like, do I really want to say this? I mean, I never said anything. I was like, either way, it's already, I already gave it to Ross. He's going to put it in the book. Like, <laughs> it's already, the script's already written. <laughs> but I was hesitant in thinking about, I am actually saying these things, and I'm actually getting to say these things. And there was a relief, but at the same time, and Ross has mentioned this in earlier talkbacks, that, and it goes with many of the kids on this campus, were afraid of repercussions of what will happen if we actually say these things. And that's a big thing that I think, that's a big problem with this is that we don't we don't get to say it because we're afraid and that's sad that we can't even speak our own mind because we're afraid so for me it became more important that I got to say these things because I wasn't the only one who were who was thinking these thoughts I wasn't the only one who accepted black jokes I wasn't the only one who was hesitant to go into the arts because I was black. I wasn't the only one who had to deal with being black. So it was more important to say it than it was to not say it. I, I wanted to add to that. Not, not only were we, because um, I just had a very intense experience my last talk back. Um, not only are we like scared of the repercussions we're also, it's also ingrained in us that it's okay to not be a human, to not be seen as human. It's okay that you're lesser than your classmates who happen to be white. It's okay that you have to work harder in order to be at the same level and still be seen as less than by certain people because that's just how we're all programmed and taught since we were babies to think. And that's how our parents were thought to think. And that's how, and it's just like this cycle. Um, and it's just part of who we are as a people, not we, but all of us. You know, that's how our education system is. That's how um, my personal family back background is. It's okay to make yourself lesser. My grandmother, and I've, I've said this before, and I think you've heard it actually, Adam. Um, my grandmother used to say, the only black things in this house are me and the pots. Mm. When my mom would bring home a black man that she was, um, you know, a black Dominican man. Um, versus like my father who was white. And he was a good guy and actually he ended up being the worst person uh, that she could have ever met. So like, you know, this is the thing that we're, we're it's ingrained even in the people that wear the color. Um, I'm sorry. Um, no, no I, I, this is like a, in this kind of culture. Um, so not only am I, when we had this discussion earlier with some of my faculty members here, um, I was scared of what repercussions were. I'm still here for another year. But it's not okay because next year, Chris is still here. Next year, Nicole's coming in. Next year, people are coming in and those people are going to have to keep fighting. So it's not okay for me to just be like, I'm just not going to say the thing. Ooh. And I have to muster up whatever courage I have, even if I'm, my whole body saying no and tears are flowing down my face and I'm terrified. Because it's not okay. It's not okay for everybody to think that this is the system that, we, that has been built for us. Okay, you guys can build it, but the system that has been built for us is a system that we live in and we're just gonna live life easier by ignoring it. Mm -hmm. That's not okay. Because people get to live in this color every day. And are getting dehumanized every day. Do you guys have any future plans for this year? <laughs> you, you, you're, this is now 
their fourth performance, and it's it's every every show we've been asked that, so it feels really good. <laughs> um, there are future plans, uh, and we we're we're talking to a couple of cultural museums as well as some schools and things like that. And there are some other things that are uh, building, but you know it's we're in an interesting uh, nexus of what that is because. We're interested in maintaining the integrity of the piece that you saw this evening, mm -hmm. as opposed to chopping it up or somehow changing it to make it a little bit more of a relief or creating more of a solution and things like that, which are the two things that we avoided uh, in this because you know it's, this isn't over. This didn't all every all the issues that we talked about didn't just end because the show was over, <laughs> right? And so uh, we were we were very adamant about maintaining that. Uh, and so there's a lot of um, discussion that has to happen about how it is that we can ensure the fact that we get to maintain that integrity and that goal. And so, uh, so there are yes, there are future plans in the making, I'd say. Uh, but you know, it's it's all exciting prospects stuff too. Oh yes, please, thank you. Please. <laughs> um, it would be really nice if you could travel with it. Typically. Californians are a little bit more educated and, you know, with it, even though on this campus you wouldn't think it. <laughs> <laughs> I've been here a year, and I've been studying racism, I've been researching racism. Um, I've been writing on racism, but I come from Georgia, I live in Georgia, and you won't believe that it's still like in the 50s or the 60s. It, it really is. And that, to the fact that, um, like here, people just ignore you, other races will ignore you and act like you're not there. But mm -hmm. in the South, they speak to you, they talk to you, but it is a different kind of race. You know, it's mm -hmm. more mm -hmm. And um, I was chosen myself for the teachers to go into a school that was in the um, black community, a really part of the community with, um, you know, everybody in the staff, 82 people, were all white, administrators were white, everything. And the kids' scores were so, so low. They sent them at fifth grade and they couldn't even read on the first and second grade level. So I was sent there. And I was getting the stuff that my parents talked about, not me. And I'm, I, I'm retired, you know, but from um, what my parents, I was getting my car scratched up, mm. my car ran into in the daytime in the school parking lot, black jelly beans on my desk mm -hmm. when I come in the morning, all the glass and stuff broken from my, you know, awards or pictures of my family. So I think that right now we need to conversate. Mm -hmm. We need more conversation. We need, um, because you all touched on almost all of the issues that we really need to talk about, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and they just need, because kids need to hear, they need to hear. I'm trying to make it up. I'm trying to fit, I'm trying to belong. And especially for the kids that are biracial, they don't know where to fit in, you know, and they feel like they're in a token of being pulled in either way. So I think we need a conversation because I was just telling a friend today that I don't think in my lifetime that I will see peace or tranquility or people getting together. I, I really don't, you know. Um, and these last few years, we've seen it even more. And, and, and we've got the blame for it, you know. President Obama got the blame for it. So, I do appreciate it, but I really wish I was going to ask before that young man did. Can you buy the video? <laughs> oh, well, actually, the, the video itself will be available online at howroundtv.com, uh, and it's ex accessible for any and all, uh, which, including this talk back, actually, can, will be accessible. Uh, and so, you know, because if you don't you, even if have you to just show the video, you can have open up conversations. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. have to be there, but. Thank you. Thank you for writing it and taking the time and presenting it. We'll look at all kinds of projects.
thank you for the support. Yes, ma'am. For the three performers, my question to all three of you is, after your Thursday through Saturday performance, how, when you get up tomorrow morning, do you put on a different coat? Do you put on a different face? How are you walking on the Is it the same? The same. It's the same. I mean, I mean, I move beyond belief as a parent, mm -hmm. uh, and just I move, and I've gone. I've heard your story, touched personal, and I'm just moved, and I'm just wondering as students, how do you, after performing that, where your mindset, where your emotional mm -hmm. status would be when you get up tomorrow morning, knowing all after you just performed that. Does that change anything, or do you, do shows get pushed back a little more? I mean, tell me something. <laughs> I mean, honestly, and this is going to sound really horrible, it, this show <laughs> angers me. It angers me that people are still going through this. Mm -hmm. It angers me that I'm going through this. And I cry when I get frustrated, and I cry when I get sad, and I get, mm -hmm. cry when I get angry, so... <laughs> um, it's 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 anger. Uh, so walking through these halls, knowing things that I've experienced by people that were supposed to be safe around, angers me. Um, also, I'm more educated, and therefore I can see the world clearer. And therefore, I can make choices. It, you know what I mean? Like, I, it takes eye opening. This is why I love theater. So you sit there, and then things are told to you, and you get to decide how you take it. Hopefully, you say this word now. Hopefully, I'm going to say it. Um, <laughs> Hopefully, you, you, you take the message and you learn from it, and then, um, yeah, and, and some type of, I mean, honestly, after, after the performance, people will come up to me and say, wow, that was touching and this and that, but they don't, they're not realizing the pain mm -hmm. that, that people with the skin color are going mm -hmm. through to wake up and and not be seen as a human yeah. every day. Um, but I said something about it, and I guess that gives me some type of um, leverage. Gives me something. Mm -hmm. I don't know what it is. Um, but that how easily can that be taken away from me? Mm -hmm. you know? It happens every second, every day. Somebody looks at me and will think, oh, look at sex. Look at that. It's like, okay, well, I'm also trying to be a person. So that's how I walk out of this last um, performance, is a little more angry, I think. And I, I hate that stereotype that like angry black people open mm -hmm. We have something to be angry about. We don't get to be a human. That's like the basic thing of, ex of of the human experience is to be a human, to be a being. And I don't get, I don't get that. I don't get to be that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I know that your question was. Uh for the, for the performance. So, uh, Chris and Taylor, if you want to add anything. Uh, yeah. Um, well, coming from where I was before, uh, I got into this project and another project before this called Sunset Baby, which was a project uh, It was written by Dominique Morissette and it was based on, uh, it was about, you know, it was in the world of black culture, black lives, dealing with that, which I had never experienced through theater before. And so that coupled with this piece, and, um, and coming from a place of um, not being aware and being indifferent because I have been given the gift of being able to live in a, in a safe Orange County community um, 
where uh, where my friends are not necessarily uh, they're they're not most of them aren't black, and so the tragedies and the events that happen out in the world, unless I take my unless I unless I'm hungry or curious about it, I won't necessarily encounter that on a daily basis. And so because of that, coming into this, I have been uh, awoken, and now I am aware of it. And me being black was something that I didn't, I didn't live with because um, I didn't, I guess, I don't know the right word for it, but I guess the phrase I didn't have to. Um, I was the black, I was the, uh, not in the story particularly, but in terms of where I grew up in high school, I was the black kid that played black basketball. And so my, even if I had a couple black friends at the school, I was without a doubt seen differently because, you know, they didn't play sports and I did. And so, you know, um, you know, I was bringing money to the school because I was playing high school basketball. I was, people were coming in, tickets were being sold and stuff. And so coming from that and now being aware and, uh, and through this project, really taking pride in me being black and not shying away from it because, or not just not even really knowing it or acknowledging it. Because um, because I wasn't reminded of it every day, or even if I was, it wasn't really registering. Um, so me waking up tomorrow, having had this experience, um, is for me personally is um, is exciting. Um, like I feel even better about myself being able to have pride in being black and wearing that now. Now, despite how the other world, despite how the world around me takes it. They're dealing with their own mess about how they feel about me. Um, that's them, you know. I'm in terms of in terms of me feeling a certain way about myself because I'm seeing through their eyes. I've learned not to do that anymore. I'm seeing through my own eyes now. I'm, I'm accepting this. So, um, and it's and we'll see what happens because quite technically this is the last day of actual school for a lot of us, for a lot of the grad students. <laughs> so, in terms of walking on campus. Uh, um, I won't be doing a lot of that, <laughs> but uh, but it coming back um, coming back next year, and then just having the summer to really mull it over and live in it and accept it, and and to go through these ups and downs and be in the world and see how the world treats me now that I'm no longer ignoring the black jokes. Now I'm like, all right, I'm not I'm not sure what's going on, but I'm gonna ask you to not to not say that around me. Or I'm gonna ask you to have a different perspective or maybe have a dialogue. You know, so why do you feel like you need to say these black jokes every time you see me? Is there something, or why do you feel like you need to say them? Why are you upset because I'm asking you not to? So these are things that I'm excited to wake up tomorrow and experience, because again, it's like I, I just, I just didn't, I just didn't. I was, I was always kind of scared, and, uh, and in terms of making friends, it's easy for me to do that. So for me to think, well, me accepting this might mean I have less friends, or people might be more confrontational. But at first was scary, and now I'm like, no, this is this is me. I'm, I am black, and I'm gonna make that known. Now, whether you're comfortable or uncomfortable with it, that is something you're going to have to deal with. But you're not gonna you're not gonna change the way I see myself. Mm. So, um, so yeah, excited, um, ready, knowing there's gonna be ups and downs, and there's gonna be some high ups, and there's gonna be some very lows that I will be experiencing for the first time. But I am without a doubt, excited to wake up with this newfound um, awareness and pride. I'm both <laughs> of those things, um, which is the easy answer. <laughs> 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 Truthfully, for me, it didn't. Tomorrow, the chain, not chain, ooh, you don't like that word either. <laughs> um, it was different for me when we started this project. I started to see things differently when he asked me to be a part of this project. When I decided to step back and look at my life. That, for me, is when I woke up different. And the thing I've been seeing is not something I like. I've been seeing the things people say. I've been seeing the friends that I talk to who aren't saying things that, I, that are funny anymore. I'm seeing the 
faculty members I'm going to, the teachers I have, who are saying things that they think are in my best interest, but are just stereotypes. Recently, I talked to a faculty member about wanting to put on musical, and the first thing they said was, oh, that's great, you can make it, you can do it hip-hop style. Mm -hmm. And I just stared at them, and I didn't understand why they said that. And then they stepped back and they were like, you know, because teenagers like hip things, right? <laughs> and it's, it's funny, but it's not. Because I would, before this, I wouldn't have heard that. Before this, that, if someone said that to me, I would have laughed and then continued the conversation. But I stopped and I decided that I wasn't going to talk about it anymore. Because from the day this project started, I have been seeing, my eyes have been opened. And at the same time, I am excited. Because now I can see these things. Because I would have just walked away. I, before this, I was. That was my life. I was walking away from all of this. I was seeing it and I was like, oh, it's fine. I'm just, it's whatever. It's just a joke. It's just a comment. It's not the end of the world. No, it's not the end of the world, but it still hurts. And as someone said in a talk back before, it's like a paper cut. You can only, and you can get so many paper cuts, but then become scars and they stay there. And they don't go away. I have a scar on my finger from a cut I got from work, and that's not going to be gone forever. I have cuts like that in my heart from all the black jokes people have told me. I can tell you right now, a, black, a bunch of black jokes. My best friend has told me. I can tell you word for word. I can tell you he laughed. I can tell you I laughed back because I didn't know what to do. So tomorrow, I'm going to wake up with my eyes open the way they were when this project started. I'm going to wake up excited because my eyes are open. And I'm going to wake up angry because I have to tell the people I love and the people I thought cared enough to know that they don't understand. So, yeah. Yes, ma'am. Uh, so she, Mirabel, kind of mentioned about my fellow neighbors who are non-human. Um, I'm a fourth year undergrad, and I have a baby who's four months old. And, like, for example, today I was walking to the jokes, and I was carrying her face and folks to see her. And a lot of people don't see me, they see my baby. And they will say, she's so cute, she's adorable. And then I even had a mother and a little girl walk past, and the mom was commenting to her daughter, Oh, this is the baby cute, she sleeps. And I said, and I have to say thank you out loud because she said I'm walking past. Mm -hmm. And I feel like there's often times where there's like an age limit to where you are doing mm -hmm. the art of where you can be visible and then somewhere there's a cutoff to where like you're out of your no rest. Yeah. Once you have an opinion, once you're yeah. speak. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, there's something along that. And I walk around in Seattle town where I go class here, and I go to the shows. So I kind of feel like just that being human. There's something about it to where whatever it is, we can acknowledge a baby, but we can't acknowledge the mother that's carrying the baby. We don't see that. So that generation is really big. Somebody talked about it. But my like, um, question was for a man, like, um, in her program, she said, uh, she asked if she was an activist because of the NCI administrators. So I wonder if, if you needed any funding because the new narratives is an NCI administrator program. Did you want to say you were an activist, but kind of held that because you needed funding? Uh, well, we, we, I think, started this project a little bit later to be able to ask for funding. Uh, but that actually came about mostly because of a project that I worked on before this, which was with the service workers mm -hmm. on this campus. And uh, we did a, a similar thing. We did story circles and wrote a new play based on their experiences and everything they went through with strikes and UCI administration, which is a really long and in-depth history. And 
a part of the show was petitions asking if UCI administration would be willing to uh, have English as a second language classes for free for the workers and also have workshops for them and their children to learn how to apply to the FAFSA, how to apply to college, all of those things um, to help them progress. And uh, so that got me into conversations with vice chancellors and uh, you know directors within human resources. And I, I went over there and uh, talked about these these petitions that we what we wanted to do for the service workers. And somehow they they had a lot of information about me. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> they knew, uh, they, you know, they knew I did that show. They knew I, what I was asking for. They knew I was going to work on this show, and so they're like, "Oh, you, you're kind of an activist, aren't you?" And I said, "Sure, give me whatever label you want to, and like it's in the program." But I, what I really care about is telling stories of individuals whose voices need to be heard. That's all I care about. I'm not afraid of of anything. Of, offending anyone or anything like that. I'm just interested in telling true stories and real experiences. So that's that's what, what that was about. But yeah, I think, I don't know if Ross wants to talk a little bit more about like, yeah. trying to get funding or anything, but <laughs> that was that was part of what, what that was about. So. Most, of the, uh, most of the funding stuff is, uh, you know, uh, timeline, timeline related and things like that. But uh, I will say that the, the word activist has gotten thrown at, at both Amanda and I. Uh, because it, in, in these in these kinds of meetings and things like that, and it, it's it's this, and it's thrown at us. I don't, I'm sure it was you too, but it's thrown at us in this in this negative connotation, like we're just troublemakers. Mm -hmm. And it's and it's it's you know it, uh, it is what it is. And so you know I got hit with oh you, you know you're becoming you know quite little activists, or uh, you're, you're uh, what was the other one? Um, you're, uh, oh yeah, you're proving to be uh, kind of a, an Afro-pessimist. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yes, sure. Uh, so, you know, um, it, it, the, those conversations happen, and it's very interesting. And so, you know, I, I will say that um, what New Narratives did for us was publicize, we're on their website, um, and, and that's kind of where where that happened, you know. And they, they they sort of promoted us at other, you know, they promoted us at their other events and things like that. And that was that's that's kind of what our partnership was, you know, because um, where we where we align with them is that it's you know conversations about uh, what their what their tagline is, conversations about race and identity and things like that. And so we we fall under that, but. Um, but I, I also will say that uh, you know there's no coincidence in the fact that Amanda and I both both had this term thrown at us in this kind of negative negative way, almost as if it were an insult in some way. Um, yeah, yeah, it's very, it's an interesting thing to bring up, and I'm, I'm thankful for what you said also regarding you and your child, because I think that that's important to realize that, you know, many of us, surprise, were actually acknowledged as human beings as human beings at some point, and then at some other point, soon after that stopped, and I think it's exactly what Megan said. It's you know when we start to develop opinions and when we start to kind of represent ourselves in a way that is either. Um, counter to what society believes of us or is disobedient to what uh, parameters society has set for us. But once there's the possibility for disobedience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or even the threat of, yeah. yeah. And, so, um, and so one of the things that we discovered within this, this uh, project, which we've talked about in past talkbacks, uh, in which I just had a wonderful conversation about just a moment ago before the show began, uh, was regarding the willing, the, the, the Willingness of the students that we interviewed at high schools and things like that, who were all willing to talk about is racism over? Why or we're not? And every one of them was ready to stand up, flip a table, and say, "No, it's not over." And here's why. <laughs> and that's and that's fantastic. That's phenomenal to get from those students, you know, who we consider to be kids. Uh, but people around our age and and you know older. Um, or beyond beyond those years, 
aren't as willing to talk about it. Hmm. And, and I believe that some of it, in, in the conversation that I was having earlier with, with Chris's parents who are here, uh, we were talking about where the rep, how, how it is that the repercussion as, as, you, as you grow, how, where the repercussions become greater and greater and greater and greater as, as you, you know, move into um, the collegiate institution and then through into larger institutions and into more corporate institutions that the repercussions or the things that we face are more detrimental because we have families to support and there's, there's more of that. Uh, and so it, it, I, so I think that some of it has to do with um, where we are in terms of creating or not living within the parameters that are set for us. Some of it has to do with that, but then the other part of it is that as we grow older, the parameters get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller until we're trapped, which is the, the, the motif in the, in, throughout the show, the jail cell used in different integrations represents the imprisonment that's more than just the, by the way, outlandish number of incarcerations for black people that happen that, that are going on right now, the new Jim Crow, uh, we are also imprisoned mentally. We're imprisoned emotionally. We're imprisoned and locked down in all of these different ways that are beyond just being incarcerated, right? Or they are being incarcerated, but they're in different ways. In some way or another, each of us are blackened and imprisoned and locked away. Some part of us are. You know, some part of us is, sorry, uh, writer. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> uh, and so it's so it's important to acknowledge that because I was talking about earlier how at some point and th this wasn't within the topics but it was after the topics sometimes these conversations these conversations continue after the topics as well they should uh, there will come a point where we'll have to sit down with our kids and not only tell them about you know birds and the bees having the sex talk but also to say there's a chance that. I might not come home someday. There's a chance that, or th there is the absolute that you will be treated differently because you look different than the people you go to school with. You look different than the people that are teaching you. You look different. I look different than the people that I work with. That. And so there's there's all of these. Sorry. There's all of these possibilities and all of these extra things that people don't see. People that aren't in the situation don't see it, and they never will see it. And that's one of the things that enrages me to the point of people being able to say, oh, no, 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 I understand. You do not. And that's, that's be, be relieved by that. Yeah. You know, because if we didn't have to understand, if we had the choice, we'd rather not understand either. But we're in the positions where we have to, and it's the conversation that we're going to have to have someday with our, ch with our children. Ma'am, you were so eloquently saying that we, you're not, you don't believe that you'll see a change in your lifetime, and many of us that sit up here don't believe that we'll see it in ours. I specifically don't feel that we'll see it in my children's lifetime. And that makes me want to fight harder. It puts me in a place of action. It puts me in a place of I have to create something that is not is not a promise of salvation, but in this moment, we're able to have these kinds of dialogues mostly safely. And it's it's terrifying in a way. You know, I mean we the, the words the words that you heard I love you. Uh, the words the words that we heard or that you that you heard well we heard we were in the audience too. Uh, of blackness is those are our youth. That's our youth. That's their response to the question, tell us what you believe the condition of blackness is. And they're saying words like fatal, terrifying, sexualized, scum, scum ingrained, like these, just these words that, that, that beaten, bruised, you know, that is, that is right now, that is what the, 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 our, our future, that's what they are, 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 are stuck believing blackness is. And that's not right in any way, shape, form, or fashion. I don't care who you are. It's not right. And so for us to 
tell those things. That was very hard. Somebody asked, somebody asked uh, one of the other topics, what was it like saying, you know, those words in response to what blackness is? And we don't, we don't want to have to say that, but we can't say it's wrong. We can't say it's incorrect, you know? Uh, and so, and so I think that it's at a very early age that at some point we no longer become, we're no longer human. We become scum, we become beaten, we become bruised, we become this, right? Um, and it's, it's not okay, it's not something that we all want to just say is going to be fine. Right? That's why, that's why you, know, you keep hearing them avoid words like change and hope, and it's because I stood in the rehearsal room and in all of these talkbacks say, we can't rely on hope. There is no hope, there is action. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that there is no hope. You know, there is, I thought we were talking about change because we don't believe we'll see it. You know, does it mean that we can't fight for it? Does it mean that we shouldn't fight for it? Yeah. We just... We can't expect to have ever hit an end goal. We can't expect to have ever, because once we believe our work is done, then that's it, right? And and we're not, I personally believe that we're not in a place right now where we should say that the work is done. Sammy had a question. Yeah. Um, less of a question, more of a comment. Uh, one of the things I was so grateful to be watching tonight, not only were we seeing a larger, broader perspective on what's happening, but I was also hearing the individuals in the room and outside of the room that were part of this. I was hearing voices, and I think that's so important because when we do hear about the things happening, when we do hear about conflicts, it's it's always rationalized in numbers, and, mm -hmm. and numbers aren't people, and it's even degraded further by rounding them. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I just want to say thank you for bringing the voices out. And the idea of bearing witness, I think, is so important and not just grouping things and categorizing things. You, you've said it in one of your later pieces. We shouldn't have to show these statistics and these numbers, but they are here, but we shouldn't have to. Thank you. Oh, excuse me, I'm going to say, um, I number one, one of the reasons why sometimes it's easier to get younger people to talk about things is because they may not have as much experience Whereas, like with my grandparents, I never really knew about her first child until I was a teenager, and that was a simple fact because the first child who had died, he was sick. They took him to the hospital, but because he was black, they had to go to the black hospital, which was further away. So, of course, by the time they got it, he died. So, I never knew about my grandfather's first son because of that, because it was pain. So, sometimes older people don't speak because of the pain. It's not just that the repercussions, but a lot of times it's the same. But what I wanted to say is I think this is important, especially with discussion, because I think when there's discussion, there's a little bit of understanding, um, and there's more so um, just putting yourself in someone else's shoes. So I hope at one point, either when you tell us, like, about, I'm, my mind is kind of close, I can't remember the name of the station that you said, or the internet site that you said that showed you this. I think this is something important for younger children, at least, to have this discussion and to open up that dialogue because, like you said earlier, we really don't discuss it. I may discuss certain issues with my friends when something happens, but a lot of the times, I think when I think about stuff, on some moments, I'm so excited about being black. I'm, my black is you know, beautiful, it's powerful, especially when I'm in the theater, when I'm thinking about times with my family. But then stuff like this today, you know, first she told me it was spoken word. I'm like, okay, I was spoken word last night, but then when I was here, I was like, hold up. I was kind of worried because the more you know, the more you're responsible for it, and the more that you know, <laughs> and the more that you get pissed off. Right. Mm -hmm. right. So just like this, I wasn't prepared for this today. So when it started, I was like, oh Lord, I can help me. It's kind of like I can't watch Rosewood all the time. I still haven't seen Selma because I get upset about stuff like. And one day I watch Rosewood, but. <laughs> I have to prepare my mind to watch certain things mm -hmm. because to see the truth just right. yes, wipes right. me out. So I just hope at some point with all the anger and with all the frustration that we live in, I pray that some of those days you also enjoy the black people. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Because this life is short. So I just pray that they, you know, things are better. And the last <laughs> note, um, I remember when President Obama got office. 
Um, I'm not really big in politics and I really don't like politics. But what cracked me up was how I cried because as a kid, you're taught, okay, you can be anything in the world. Mm. But being a president was never, I, I right. knew as a child, well, you could be anything in the world, you could be a president. Oh, tell me I can be a president all these white men. Yeah. I'll never be a president. So when he was actually elected, I cried because my cousin's daughter, who is 10 now, we said, oh, the president of the United States, oh, she's like, oh, you know, in her life, she saw it. So even if there's not that much change from my life to her, it's still a little bit. So I just want to share this, especially with younger people. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. One, of, one of the things that we, we talked about, we talked about many times, is that you know, we enjoy the idea of being able to do this in the theatrical media because we're able to have this kind of conversation. Somebody asked us, I think it was our second performance, mm -hmm. whether or not we were considering the idea of doing yes. a film as the first. I'm sorry. Oh, for uh, sure. Whether I, hey, we were on the same page. <laughs> <laughs> whether we were considering turning this into something uh, more in a film medium. And, and it's an intriguing thought and things like that. It's just unfortunate because of who runs Hollywood and how the message would get skewed from that. Mm -hmm. But also, uh, we don't get to have this kind of dialogue after the film. The film ends, the credits roll, everyone goes home, and they find their own solution in it. They, they seek their salvation. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's one of the things that, one of the things that we, we're proud of with this and that we've been credited upon by some by scholars actually that have been here, which is really amazing, uh, that we created no sense of sanctuary because for because the fact of the matter is that for us, as uh, black people or people of color, women and people of color, we don't have sanctuary. There is not that safe place. You know, some of us have the home, but some of I, I grew up without being safe in my own home because of what my father was and how he is or was. And so, uh, well, I guess, but so um, that, that is something that was very important to me to say, not everybody has sanctuary. Not everyone has a place where they go and they're protected and they're safe and they're okay. Well, we didn't all have that. And so, um, so in, 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 in keeping with also uh, what we were talking about with uh, President Obama, the, the, thing with, the thing with President Obama is that Yes, it's 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 almost it's almost new frontierish what he achieved for us and what what happened. But the other the other side of that is that it also creates this perception of I talked about the I, I, I briefly mentioned a book called The New Jim Crow earlier. I just kind of shouted out the title, but it's a book, The New Jim Crow. And it's amazing. Uh, and the, the, what it does is that it challenges uh, this era of color blindness that people perceive that we live in now that we have a black president. And it's not, that's not the case. We're not, we didn't get a black president and then racism ended. No matter, I, I, no matter what the RNC tells you, that's not the case. You know, I'm sorry? Oh, yes ma'am, absolutely. You know, and, and the other thing is that hate, hate doesn't just disappear. You know, it re-manifests. In a way, it, 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 it disguises, it, it wears a new disguise, but it doesn't just go away. And so, I, I personally, as 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 um, as hard as it is to write these stories, to tell these stories, to sit up in that you know back house left seat every night and listen to the stories for what the stories are, not because of anything that you're doing, because they're doing such a fantastic job, and we've all done very well. But it's that. You know, the stories are not easy always to hear, and so, uh, so, but but at the same time, there is joy in that we've created something that creates this kind of dialogue and this kind of conversation. Again, it does not offer a solution. We do not say everything is going to be better now that we've seen this. You know, we can't say that just because you're in a place. You know, if you watch this and you're now in a place where, in the deepest crevices of your heart and soul, you feel that you are not a racist, that's great, but your job's not done. Hmm. You've not fulfilled, you know, the conversations that take place outside of this room are part of what continues, uh, that continues the pursuit. I think it was Chris the other day who was talking about the pursuit of perfection is more important than reaching perfection itself because we'll never reach perfection. Um, you also you mentioned that, um, and I, I've mentioned this. Thank and, you. Uh, we, we were talking about this in the last talk back, and, and in other conversations that, uh, that we've had with with individuals that have, have stuck around and, and talked to us about it. We were talking about movies like Selma and and things like that. And um, I think they're 
Hollywood grossly misrepresents events of, of uh, it grossly misrepresents things, but it, mo it grossly misrepresents blackness and black history and, and the struggle that is currently happening that people live with and are and are, are, are navigating through and suffocating with every single day because Hollywood will look at it and it'll say and and, 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 it's, and it's and it's movies movies like Selma get created and it says, Oh, this all ended in nineteen sixty four, this is no longer a problem. Mm -hmm. Everybody's happy, racism is over, we already fought for this. We don't have to keep fighting anymore. And that's just not the case because it, all that all that happened was on paper things look better, but the reality is that people are fighting and struggling, and that my children are going to fight and struggle, and and, and you 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 can't just watch those movies and think that everything's going to be okay, and and that's sort of some an issue that I have with with, and that I think everybody up here has with. media and like the way in which it can skew everything and the way in which um, yeah it just it makes it seem like it, it lessens the problem and it makes it seem like people that still talk about it are just whining about it that there isn't really a struggle there really there really isn't a fight anymore um, it's just people being sensitive it's just people not understanding you know it's just people it's be, it, it's people Thinking that because, yeah, it it it's, it it lessens. It offers one. It offers a solution. It offers hope. It offers some sort of manifestation of, I don't know, I can't, yeah, of something. But it also it offers, yeah, and it's just and it's and it's just not the case. And so you, yeah, you just you mentioned those movies and it made me think about about that conversation and just, and, and how, I mean, I, I had a conversation with, with someone the other day and they said, they told me, oh, but there's so many black actors in Hollywood now. What? And I just looked at him. <laughs> I looked at him and I said, yeah, but what roles are those actors playing? They're playing slaves. They're playing, they're, they're, they're playing people in prison. They're playing thugs. They're, you know, they're not playing human beings. They're not. They're playing stereotypical Identification, they're not playing you. Yeah, exactly. And, and he just looked at me and was just kind of like, but, but they're in the movies. <laughs> but, they're, but they're being included. They're being included. But and, and, and then he brought up movies like, like Selma and like The Help and things like that. And, 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 and he was talking to me about how he feels like black history is being remembered. And, and in a way, okay, yeah, but not the full history is not being remembered. High schools don't teach about Black Wall Street. High schools don't teach about, they don't teach the full spectrum of, of history, and they, and they stop at 1964. They don't go past it, you know? Except you, to talk about riots. Yeah, yeah, except to, to and, and when they do talk about riots, it's, it's oh, but this ended in 1964, and these guys are just whining, they're just mad about, about weird things, and, and you know, it, and they say these people, and they, you know, and they, they make it, they, they skew it and they twist it, and, and um, somebody at, at a previous talk back had mentioned how a great way, because we were talking about how the purpose of this project is to raise awareness, um, and a person had suggested that maybe a way to do that is, is in the education system, and to make, and, and to acknowledge that black history is American history, um, and that it, it deserves more than just like the 20 minutes that get taught in class, and we were saying that's, yes, but also the material that is taught needs to be thought about because you can't just teach certain parts. You can't just, because it, it grossly misrepresents stuff. I and mean, that's a, a tangent, but. Oh, no, I mean, there's, there's, something in, there's something important in that about introducing this kind of, this kind of study to uh, a young education system in that people will want to uh, protect mm -hmm. their students from this kind of information. And you know, it's one of the things that like, it warms me to see young black children, boys, young men, young women in this audience, you know, over the course of the four performances that we've had. Uh, it warms me to see that because it really is the opportunity for us to supply this kind of information to 
so that when they go back to these schools and they're faced with this adversity that they have fodder, they themselves finally have some ammunition. I, I don't, I don't, you know, what, what little we can supply, but the important thing being that, you know, we're, we're, it, it creates the opportunity to potentially, in some way, allow that person to defend themselves you know, that much more, right? Uh, and then the opening sequence of this show is grounded in, and what, and what the producers now have mentioned, it's grounded in the fact that, you know, there are people that believe that racism happens when CNN tells you it happens, mm. or Fox News tells you it happens, mm. or when, you know, <laughs> uh, when, you know, when it's in the media, right? And that it happens at that moment when the media is talking about it, and then we move on to the next story, or we change the channel, and then it's now all of a sudden it's gone. It's gone. You know, we create, we create by flipping past these channels or by scrolling through these segments. We create this uh, false sense of uh, detachment from from what is happening. And you know, our point is on uh, what Sammy was saying earlier: the individual, and about how the people that face the same struggle, the same struggle that you see uh, on. On, on, on the television, you're sitting next to them at this moment, or you're living right down the street from them. They're your neighbors. They're the person that you uh, sat across from in the lunchroom today, or wherever it is, you know, the restaurant that you ate at, or the coffee shop that you went to. These are the people you have the opportunity to reach out to and touch, right? And no one takes that information and says, you know, uh, let me acknowledge, you know, or, or whatever that is. You know, I don't want anybody coming to me in a coffee shop and saying, you black, you had it, you had it hard. You know I mean? I don't, I don't want that either, but I'm just saying that, you know, these, that the incidents of this are not isolated and rare. They are present, ever present. You know? And there's always, you know, there's the macroaggressions that we see that are covered nationally, and there's the microaggressions that we face every single second of every single day that go without acknowledgement when somebody says, oh, well, these things happen every now and then. It doesn't happen all the time, you know? And where you're, that, that when you do that, you're deteriorating the, the poignancy of the things that we have to, you know, that we otherwise uh, go through as, as a person of color. Yeah. 